And welcome back. A um, very good uh, message here from Mitch. Well, they're all good, really, but I want to read this one out. Nick, it's all very well for politicians like you, ex-politicians, uh, from back in the day. Oh, yes, I see, I see your point. To talk about having to have a vision for the future. Uh, but we now live in a highly connected, globalised world where that vision in opposition is pretty quickly derailed when in government by catastrophic global events such as the credit crunch, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine and now the problems in Gaza. The truth is that government has out of necessity become much more about firefighting and less about having a long-term plan. Oh, long-term plan, remember that? That was David Cameron. Mitch, you're right. We are constantly reacting to events and I would also say domestic, the way m news habits have changed, uh, uh, you know, suddenly you're having a government having to respond to a crisis the Daily Mail or the Daily Mirror has brought up. Remember when we were talking about concrete collapsing in schools, you would have thought that was the major topic and it actually... Has any, does anyone remember it until I reminded them of it? And that happens a lot. And government is on a day-to-day -day necessary firefighting. But there is a reason for that. There is, um, there is a reason because the character of a government is tested under both those domestic issues and international issues, not to lose the very foundations upon which it is fighting for. Um, and, and whilst I fully respect that they can be derailed by the media and they can be derailed by particular issues that are flagged up, I don't think that should detract a party away from its core values and beliefs. And maybe, uh, maybe tomorrow even, uh, we will uh, discuss whether core values and beliefs, what they are, because I think that they can translate across most crises. And of course, governments have to deal with international crises such as Ukraine and Gaza. Uh, but so did Margaret Thatcher. Uh, she had the Falklands, uh, remember, just to name one of them. And yet, people don't ever accuse her of not having a core vision and a core belief of what Britain should be like. I just put that out there for the conversation. Now we're going to take more of your calls. And I want to go through some of the messages because um, this one from Alex. Nick, the Tories had an 80 seat majority and could have done anything they wished. Spot on. In fact, I said that on this studio on election night. They've been split uh, 2019. They have been split and divided with vicious infighting and have turned into a middle of the road party which is hardly distinguishable from Labour. I think on immigration, it is very distinguishable. Labour aren't saying anything. Conservatives are at least saying things and trying to do things. Not much of a choice for voters. I understand that. I think it's not an unreasonable point you make there. Um, we forget, says Mark, the shambles Labour have caused in the past. A Labour win could be the best thing for the Tories, maybe not the country. Labour haven't been in power since the rise of social media along with many false conspiracies. It's interesting the, the idea that a Labour government is good for a Conservative government because they shape up their ideas and Labour mess it up. Pff, not so sure about that. I think actually what's changed about the British electorate since the, before the 70s is they're quite happy to give a government the benefit of the doubt for at least one general election so that they will almost certainly return a party uh, after it's won one election for two elections. Keir Starmer's saying, give me a 10-year term. He knows full well if he wins the first term, chances are he will get a second term. With one caveat to that, by the way, every time Labour have come to power, they have inherited a strong economy, a growing economy. Even under John Major, when Tony Blair came in, we'd had something like five quarters of, of growth as we came out of uh, the financial crisis he's faced. This time, it's going to be different, which is why how Labour respond to the pressure to keep spending and spending and spending when they said, oh, we can't until we grow the economy and exceptionally grow the economy, it's going to be a very interesting dynamic. They've not had to deal with that before. Let's go to Michael in Blackburn. Michael, hello. Hi. Hi. And um, what would you like to talk about, Michael? Uh, basically, your question is, um, yes, what, what would what, make yeah. people vote for the Conservatives? Yeah, can you can, can you can can you win the can they win your trust back? What would make them win your trust back? Um, I mean, the basic thing is, I would say that uh, if we uh, if they put a pause on immigration, say for six months, and they would have to do this without signalling it, they would have to do it you know, in a couple of days, otherwise everybody would be rushing 
to get through the doors. That would give a signal to the electorate, it's not all words, and that they were going to do something. Um, and this is the thing which would affect people. A lot of people don't watch talk TV and things like that. All they're interested in is when they put the petrol in their car and when they see the gas and electric bills, that's what makes them sit up and take notice, basically. And when they see okay. foreigners in countries, let yeah. me just let me just put this to you: What happens when you go into a restaurant and you can't get served because the chef isn't there, the waiter isn't there? What happens when you go into uh, your garage, your coffee shop, or whatever, and there's someone not working behind there and it's shut two days a week? Because that would be the effect. At the moment, there's already places doing that because they can't staff them. And we can't get people in this country back to work because it seems like for a lot of them, the benefit system seems to encourage them to stay economically inactive and other reasons. What would we do then? Because that would be the effect of what you're suggesting. But the question is, what would you do to get the Conservatives back into power? And that is the thing immaterial of what you're saying there that is the thing which would make people vote for the Conservatives. I understand where you're coming from with that respect, because any um, anywhere that you go, they're all uh, uh, hotels, etc. They're all East European, etc. Mm. Um, mm. And, and I, I get your point. It's, it's, a, it's a consequence of it, because I think what you're saying, and I understand this, Michael, is you've lost confidence in the government's ability to control its own borders. The one promise of Brexit that was clear as a bell, and they yeah. have not managed to do that. Michael, I think you make the point very well, and you're right, there would be consequences, uh, but the, uh, the point is this government's failed to control its borders, therefore, would controlling the borders, getting that right in the year that's left before the general election, be enough to win the trust of the government and you to lend them your vote once again. 0344 four double nine one thousand. Is it as simple as that? Let's go to Glenn in Ross on Y. Glenn, hello. Hi Nick, how are you? Very well indeed. What would you like to talk about? There's three main things yep. really. First of all, has been brought up already is immigration. Oh let me tell you first that I'm a floating voter. Okay. So immigration, yes, yes, it's a problem. Whoever can put it right will get a big vote. A lot of people are saying, oh, the only way we can do it is get rid of the ACHR, that's the European yep. uh, human rights thing. Yep, yep, well, B what's basically. Let's get rid of it. Why, uh, why so do you... The thing is, this Go on. will... All sorts of politicians, House of Lords and everything else will kick up and say, oh, we can't possibly do this. I don't know why we just don't ignore it. I actually <laughs> don't know why we cannot on some things. Just ignore it. I promise you, other countries do. They do. They do. And the other thing we can help stop it is by taking all the goodies away. If somebody arrives in the south of Italy, they put along... They land on the coast, and if they're lucky, they'll have a tent put up for them. And if there's some local charity available, they'll be given food. Whereas if they cross the channel in this country, it's all welcome. Yes, we can put you up in a three-star hotel. You'll have three meals a day, and we'll even give you a bit of pocket money to help. We've got to get rid of that. And I don't think there's any of the political parties who are prepared to do it. Now, second on my agenda is yep. for me to change my vote is hereditary tax. I'm a person of a certain age... Do you mean inheritance tax? Pardon? Do you mean inheritance tax? Inheritance OK, tax. understood. Yep, yep. Thanks. Uh, I'm of a certain age, like a lot of the people. We may have a little bit of money, money in the bank and we own a own house. When we die, what happens? Over a certain amount, the company's go, country's going to take up to 40% of that money... And uh, a lot of us who have already paid tax throughout our careers are thinking, well, what the hell is this? So I think if somebody could reform that, that would be 
a, a, a big pull as well for whichever party do it. Well, I'm with you on that one. It's a hideous yeah. tax. And your third and final. Go on, Glenn. The third and final, the House of Lords. What's wrong with it? Everything. No, it's not. I'm going to put up a defence of it. Listen, Glenn, in a word, what's wrong with it? Give me give me a top reason. Let, let's say that the people who are put, put, being put into the yep. House of Lords. Yep, there's some right old so-and-sos right. who shouldn't be there. Be, I agree. They can be sports stars. They can yep. be television presenters. Yep. And I think to myself, people like that, they've got a certain control. You know, they have. In no country... Glenn, oh, for, for Glenn, I'm go Let's Glenn, Glenn, bear with me. Uh, Glenn, I'm, I'm going to give you my answer and I'm keeping an eye on the clock um, uh, because why well, I'm going to defend the House of Lords, OK? So, in a nutshell, here, here I go. All right, let's start from the beginning. We've had crooks in the House of Lords and we've had people who are unfit to be there and there's been cronyism. I grant you, I'm not defending that. You see it in a lot of walks of life. That can be reformed, and I believe we should put a retirement age on in the House of Lords. But there is, I believe, an overriding reason to support the House of Lords. It is this, that a House of Lords is meant to be a revising chamber. It is meant to advise and revise legislation, having studied it deeply, to the government of the day, always willing to accede to the ultimate wish of the House of Commons, which is what is represented, uh, represents you, the people. However, what I like about the House of Lords is, is that you've got real experts going in there. Let me tell you this. I could have stood up in the House of Commons and given a three, four, five minute speech pretty much on any subject. And the chances are I could have been waffling, I could have been talking rubbish, and I wouldn't have been challenged or caught out unless there happened to be an expert there. In the Lords, you can't make that speech. You've got former Chiefs of Staff of the Army, you've got educational experts who spent a lifetime there, people in the health service who can challenge both the prejudice and the priorities that come with the government of the day. It's a good revising chamber. It has flaws, but let's not give it up. I think it's worth backing.